overall stock markets were up super strong. Just super fragmented, not only on the supply side, but also from a buyer perspective, when you think about the requirements for the countries. Our mission is to give people access to information and have their voices heard. So it's about these two-way conversations that we're trying to set up. And welcome everyone to the 2022 Slater Pod 100. Hello there. Hey Florian, happy new year. Happy new year on this uh, January 12th and it's episode 100, Esther. It's the Century Pod. Yes, it is. Yes, it is indeed. It's the Century Pod. We have done 100 we podcasts. Made it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, Excellent. We haven't. We haven't yet. We're about to. So, oh, yeah. Great guest today. Um, the CEO of Clear Tech, formerly known as Translators Without Borders. So, a fitting guest for today's episode 100 is Andrew Bradenkamp. And of course, Andrew uh, is also known as the founder and former CEO of Acrolink, so, you know, the content, uh, content governments uh, platform. Mm -hmm. uh, stay tuned for a fascinating conversation. We had Andrew actually as our uh, one of the last speakers for our in person conferences back in 2019 in yeah. Amsterdam. That's right. More than two years ago, believe it or not. Good old days of in-person conferences. Good old days. Yeah. It's crazy. Like that uh, two years on and there's still like there, there's some ambitious people have scheduled in-person conferences. I think even uh, Gala is is, is uh, trying to do something in San Diego, repeating the San Diego conference. But, uh, you know, with, with mm. the Omicron variant and all these continued restrictions, uh, you know, it's kind of doubtful. So let's I see. Uh, let's mm. see. But first, the news. I mean, we got three weeks to catch up. I checked before. This is probably the longest pop break we've ever taken. I actually don't know why. Mm -hmm. uh, long Christmas break, and uh, now we're back after three weeks. But a lot has happened. So let's get right into it. So first, just want to briefly talk about the best and worst performing LSPs. All right, it's a little bit clickbaity. It's the best and worst performing listed <laughs> LSPs. Okay. Yeah, somewhat reduced number. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit of a reduced number. Uh, and then we're going to talk about Unbobble Surprise Acquisition, Language IO, Fundraise, uh, Straker M&A, and Global's Investment. So a lot of financial uh, topics, of course, because mm -hmm. there was no holiday breaks for the investors <laughs> and the companies looking to buy other companies. Um, so who was top, Esther? Who was the top performing listed, meaning quoted and traded on the stock market LSP of 2021? Where should I put my money? Do, it sounds like you're going to do a drum roll. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> well, okay. I'll just say drum roll. Drum roll. Uh, it was Zoo Digital. Ah. Yes, the London, well, not L London listed, but uh, Sheffield based Zoo Digital media localization company um, did pretty well. They finished top of the list. Among finished top of the list. So companies. if I had invested 100 quid at the start of 2021, yeah. how many quid would I have now? <laughs> Are you going to make me do some maths? Um, it's just what double. Is it? It's up like. Okay, there you go. I was going to say it's up 100 and something percent. Yeah. So, so double. Yes. So I would have Good. 200 quid. I would like double the amount of money. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. So then That's not a, bad, not a bad return, I would say. It's not a bad return. So if we double this again, we get 400 quid, 800 quid. And then, you know, yes. in 10 years or something, we retire to an island <laughs> and watch Netflix, which was subtitled and dubbed by Sue Digital. All right, okay. uh, let's uh, yeah. not belabor this further. Uh, number two was uh, not a, a, a an, an LSP, but basically a company that owns an LSP, Amen Healthcare. Uh, they own, uh, who do they own? Stratus, Stratus. Video, right? Yes. So they've, yeah, they've rebranded, but that's who they acquired. Rebranded. And they were up, let me just check the notes here. They were up 77%. Quite good performance. Number three was Teleperformance, who own language uh, line, so another kind of remote interpreter. Uh, they were up um, forty percent, but of course, Teleperformance, a much bigger conglomerate. Number four is mm -hmm. RWS. Number five is Hunyaku Center, still in the positive. Then Straker just eked out a gain of like five percent or something. Uh, keywords is flat. Up Health. Uh, those are the ones that also uh, like a. Kind of a healthcare. They only spec. just began trading, didn't yeah, they? Yeah, they only like just began trading. So this, it's not yeah. for the full 2021. Then Rosetta, 
going down to the negative a- AI media is was down 27%. So, you know, you would have mm-hmm. left with fewer quit. And uh, then Appen, which kind of tanked last year, is like uh, minus, like you less than half or 56% down. And then THG Holdings, I actually don't know what's going on with THG. They own, who do they own? Language Connect? Um, L- THG Fluently. Yeah. THG Fluently, <laughs> right. They, they rebranded. Yes. Uh, and so they were down, but that that's not going to be connected to the LSP holdings. So um, mixed bag. Uh, overall, stock markets were up super strong in 2021, one of the best years, uh, I think, for a while. Uh, and so, you know, Sudicial did well, AMN did super well, and uh, the rest was kind of uh, mixed bag. So I also checked that... Uh, well, and we've got a new one to add, haven't we? We've got, we've got a, a new, new one, one to add, add to the, to the <laughs> Yeah, you're right. Who, who's that? Tell us more. Uh, it's Star 7. Star Seven. Our friends in Italy. Our it's friends a little bit Italy. complex because they're partially owned by a star group, but they listed some of their shares at least on, uh, I think it was in Milan, on uh, the Euronext growth. So we'll track them. We'll start to track them and see how, they're, how they do in the long term. Yeah, I would, I would love to have like a financial expert on the pot and just walk me through this maneuver. So it's a Swiss company that owns mm. or that acquired an Italian company. And then that Italian company... Floats twenty or twenty five percent of their shares in a stock market and raises like fifteen million euros, 15, which isn't yeah. exactly a lot. So, yeah, that's a, a complicated maneuver to. But it's the company that acquired Localize, isn't it? You're right. Um, as well, quite recently, so they were also in the news for that. So I'm sure they there probably was some part of the uh, financing of the Localize, like like eyes, like your eyes, eyes, mm-hmm. the sea eyes. Um, and um, that was part of that IPO of that company or that listing of those 25% shares that probably financed that uh, localized deal. Anyway, complicated. Don't really get it. Mounts seem a little small to go through a, a listing process. But hey, here they are. And let's go and track them. Mm-hmm. A firmly private company is Unbobble. Who did they buy, Esther? They acquired Lingo24. And um, why was this a yeah, surprise? Not, not long ago. <laughs> why was it a surprise? Um, well, I suppose last thing before Christmas, we weren't sure if any other deals were going to come in. No, uh, more so to do, I think, with the profile to do with the profile of uh, of the companies, really. So you've got Unbabble, sort of heavily tech enabled, etc., buying a more um, well decades old LSP, uh, which obviously is also tech, but uh, more kind of tra- on the traditional language services provision side of things. This is one of the first deals where we see the, one of those kind of AI agency, well-funded VC mm. level startups uh, buying a more traditional LSP, I believe, especially, I think in terms of the size, it's probably the biggest uh, so far. And, uh, you know, for, so again, Unbubble based in Lisbon, California slash California, Lingo24, I think is based in Edinburgh. Uh, they have an operational yeah. hub in Central Europe, as far as I remember. And the business was founded and was probably majority owned by Christian Arno, who I met a couple of times at our conferences. And I think he had stepped back from the CEO leadership role a couple of years yeah. ago, maybe two, three years ago. And uh, and now they you know they sold the company to Unbobble. Again, kind of AI agency slash tech enabled. We had Vasco on the podcast, of course. So uh, Vasco, the CEO of Unbubble, he said that the acquisition will allow them to expand beyond customer service faster and deliver a more comprehensive multilingual solution for customer experience, starting with the first touch point in the customer journey, marketing content. So Lingo24 you know, has a nice customer base on the marketing content side. So they're, you know, mm. the core kind of vertical for Unbubble was that customer service content, automation, et cetera. And now they're going a little bit uh, further and also covering marketing content. Uh, they also said that the the brand, the Lingo24 brand, will stay over the short term, which means over the mid to long it's term. Disappear. <laughs> probably going to disappear. Uh, yeah. Uh, Vasco also told us that they didn't have any kind of prior business relationship before the deal. So, you know, this, yeah, they didn't have any uh, crossover there. And, you know, mm. key, he also mentioned that the Lingo24 com- comes with a wealth of customer relationship and experience delivering to enterprise customers. So this is probably one of the key drivers of this acquisition that you can get a very nice, very diverse enterprise customer base in a deal, right? So mm. that's when then Unbubble, it takes, it takes forever to establish these enterprise relationships. We know that you need a ton of salespeople, a ton of marketing dollars. And if you can do this uh, via an acquisition, 
uh, that's great. And then Unbubble can go in and uh, really uh, roll out their kind of tech efficiencies, I would assume, as far as they, mm. they want, right? Uh, yeah, so interesting move by, by this AI agency, AI agency to acquire a more kind of traditional uh, LSP. Um, we talked about the kind of customer portfolio. And, you know, I, I'm really curious if we're going to see more of that. I mean, maybe Lil's going to try to uh, buy something at some point. Who knows, right? So interesting dynamics here if you bring in these kind of VC-funded uh, companies uh, into the, the M&A mix, right? So who knows? Maybe Smartling will yeah. continue to come back on the acquisition trail at some point as well. All right, uh, Esther, so there's another company that we are very familiar with that um, we also had on the pod that is a little earlier in the yeah. startup journey. Uh, tell us more about that uh, and uh, how much money they raised. Yeah, so you're talking about language I slash O, language I O, um, and we had their, the company's founders, uh, co-founders on the pod. Uh, so yeah, they've just announced a, a raise. I think it was sort of... Uh, well, a couple of days ago, 11th of January, um, they announced um, they had raised 6.5 million US dollars in a Series A. Uh, so that was, I think they had a seed round March 2021, about 5 million. And total raised to date is 12, just over 12 million US dollars. Uh, so they, uh, yeah, start up in the sense that, uh, I mean, they got going uh, several years ago, but they've been um, kind of looking more so onto the customizable MT solution side, and they focus also on customer service content, um, high volume customer service content. So basically, um, they just, have, just to pause it, I mean, basically yeah. Unbubble's original vision, right? Sure. Yeah. yeah, exactly. The kind of customer service content, high volume, um, they offer sort of a ton of connectors as well. So trying to automate that that process. I mean, I think to begin with, we were kind of referring to them as, as an AI agency, so this like sort no. of putting them in a similar similar bracket. But, um, but, but I would yeah, say they, they're coupling. They, I would sorry. Mm -hmm. I would sorry to pause you again. Uh, I, I don't think it's an AI agency. I mean, they're pure tech. I mean, they may have a little bit of managed services, of course, but I think this is pure tech. There's no agency model. It's not like they're sending. I, I also remember from the podcast, they're not sending a lot of content mm -hmm. out to translators. This is mostly just technology. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. No, good point. I mean, I think, yeah, they, they've got a workflow. I think we even, they even provided us with like a, an example of some of the, the workflows um, yeah. that we put in the article. So anyone who's interested, have a look at that. But it kind of couples, relies on MT, coupled with kind of uh, extensive glossaries um, and, and lots of other things as well. But so their round was led by uh, Gaurav Tiwari from a VC firm called Omega Venture Partners based in Silicon Valley. The round was also participated in by existing investors and one new VC investor called Caruso Ventures. Um, apparently, the CEO, Heather Morgan Shoemaker, told us that the round was actually oversubscribed and they, they were the ones who capped it at uh, $6.5 million. Uh, what so, to do with all that money? No, this is prudent. It's prudent. Yeah. I mean, it's like if you, yeah. if you can raise more, but you don't really have an immediate, I guess, maybe use or plan or strategy for it. Like why, right? Mm. Eventually you need mm. to deliver on all that money raised and, uh, you know, you probably sure. want to be prudent. So, Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, so what to do with the money? Good question. Um, they're going to be doing um, some active hiring, uh, more active hiring. They've hired a CTO, a C, well, Chief Information Security Officer and also a VP of Partnerships recently. But they're now also actively hiring in the UK, in Europe, um, as well as in the home market of the US. And they want to also scale sales marketing, which I'm sure they'll um, use some of that money for. Uh, they're going to uh, also hire into R&D, uh, so research and development with the aim of expanding into um, kind of conversational conversational voice. Um, so I suppose more so on the, yeah, like chatbot type thing. Chatbot type thing. I would thing. imagine. Yep. Yes. We need to bring them back on there the There you pod. go. Congrats to mm. Language.io. And um, moving to a cross-continental deal, our friends at Straker bought another boutique LSP. This time they bought Edest, which was founded in 1990, 1990 not 1999, 1990. It currently employs 18 staff uh, based in Belgium. Annual revenue is currently of 4 million euros, EBITDA of around 400,000 euros, so 10% EBITDA margin. Transaction closed on January 1st, 2022. 
Uh, and so yeah, Straker is known for you know acquiring uh, relatively small boutique LSPs and kind of moving it onto their platform, etc. Of course, now mm -hmm. they also have Lingotech. Um, and so the EDA CEO Jean Paul Dispo told, um, well, was quoted in a press release rather. He didn't tell us, but they they quoted him in a press release that they first met um, uh, Straker CEO Grant Straker in 2017. This talked about an acquisition at the time. They said, well, it's maybe a little early. We'd like to focus on growing the business. Uh, growing the business they did, uh, scaling from 20, uh, from 1.8 million euro, uh, euro in 2020 to 2.8 mm. and now, uh, well, four kind of run rate, I guess. And Straker will pay, um, this is an interesting deal. It's almost, it's more than half is actually in an, in what's called an earn out, right? For some of the, mm. uh, CEOs that are listening to this part that are looking to sell a company. Um, you know, it, Straker typically goes, uh, quite heavy on the earn out, meaning, Part of the compensation you're getting for selling your company is in deferred payments, depending on the performance. Mm -hmm. So they say, well, you need to hit, hit X, Y, Z revenue targets. And if you do, uh, we're going to pay you an additional uh, uh, amount, right? So in this case, they pay 1.7 million in cash euro and uh, 250,000 euros in shares, circuit shares. And then over two years, the, the founder... Um, the EDIS uh, uh, CEO could get another 2.5 million in earnouts. So that puts yeah. the entire price tag at around, what is it? Uh, 4.5 million euro, which is quite a lot. It's kind of more than one time revenue and like 11 times EBITDA. So uh, stretchy, stretchy for a uh, boutique LSP. Also the clients are mostly, I think, uh, public sector. So very heavily with the Euro European Union Commission, given the location, mm -hmm. of course. And other institutions. You said they're in Belgium. Is it Belgium? The, uh, yes, yes, they're in Belgium. I hope I'm okay. Okay, this one. I think yeah. so. So I mean, Belgium, mm -hmm. Brussels, right? And no, they're yeah. they're in Brussels, based in Brussels. So European Commission, mm -hmm. kind of obvious. Uh, interesting move from Straker. Did not see them buying anything in the public sector space. So, you know, good good luck responding to those uh, lengthy mm -hmm. RFPs that certainly are coming down the pipe. Um. All right. So next up is another uh, former podcast guest, Global Healthcare. Yes. Interpreting and other interpreting. What happened there mm -hmm. while we were away? Yeah. Well, this is quite <laughs> quite recent news as well. I think broke also this week. Um, so Globo, um, as you said, uh, it's a US based interpreting or on-demand interpreting and services provider, uh, they secured a, a growth investment from um, VSS Capital Partners. Um, so it was a minority growth investment. Um, we don't know the specifics yet, or maybe never, around the <laughs> amount, the term, <laughs> around the amount, the terms, um, the valuation, etc. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting in the sense that, um, as you said, uh, Globo uh, operates a lot within healthcare, so they would work for clients, including hospital systems, physicians, healthcare insurers, um, also across other sectors such as financial services. So that, I think when Gene spoke at Slatecon recently, he was talking a little bit about insurance, sort of the insurance providers, mortgage service uh, providers also, banks, things like that. So um, alongside also technology, education and public services more generally um, would be their current um, end markets. Um, and they supply services, as I said, on demand, uh, both telephone and video uh, interpreting, as well as on site and sign language interpreting. So that's kind of the, the core services there. Um, a lot in addition to providing, I suppose, translation of documents, emails, texts, chats, um, probably sort of a, a, a significantly less uh, or lower part of the of the business there. Um, they have their own cloud-based platform as well called Global HQ. So that's kind of the the hub for managing uh, everything uh, through. And um, yeah, they plan to expand the service, expand the expand into other markets. Sorry, so other end markets. So both uh, we'll find out a bit more in, as to what plans are specifically for which markets to target and what what where the biggest traction is at the moment. Um, but interestingly, VSS, um, so they, I mean, they're kind of big into healthcare themselves, the investors, so they, um, their current portfolio, I mean, they say their focus is healthcare, business services, and education. So you can kind of see clearly where Globo fits into, into that um, focus as well. 
I think, I mean, this is mostly US centric, right? Uh, still, uh, yeah. I think the yeah. European remote interpreting, not okay, like video remote slash generally just remote, even OPI yeah. market is one of the few remaining. I wouldn't say green fields, but I think massive opportunities for somebody who's willing to invest in it. Uh, I mean, the U.S., you're seeing all this activity, all of these big conglomerates yeah. buying, uh, interpreting providers, now global raising money. Uh, well, you talked about Propio as well, I think. we've got. Uh, oh, you're right. We just had... Yeah, we don't have that on the agenda, but I think we literally just published it, what, minutes ago? Um mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. Healthcare. They acquired a couple, but they also had some growth equity um, sort of okay. six months or so ago. To your point of investors coming into that into that market, and th again, that's US, right? So, and then we mm -hmm. have all yep. of these. Uh, uh, I mean, companies kind of national companies along kind of national boundaries in in Europe, right? You got the Swedish. Uh, um, uh, uh, digital talk. Di 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 digital talk. Yes, I mean we have big word in, in the UK, yeah. etc. Uh, but I mean, if anybody could scale this p across Europe, huge opportunity, mm. huge opportunity. Uh, and nobody's That's super tried. fragmented though. Like we, we yeah. were talking about this at Satecon, weren't we on the, on the panel? Just super fragmented, not only on the supply side, but also from a buyer perspective. I know. Think yeah. The that's the, that's the challenge. Countries. That's the challenge. That is the challenge and the opportunity, I suppose. And the opportunity. So no, I mean, seriously, <laughs> I mean, there, there are other areas. I mean. There are many, 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 many other business services that have successfully managed to, you know, grow across like all the of the European sector. Union and you know UK and Switzerland, etc. Like this, this is this should not be an exception. Is it complex mm -hmm. to tailor your requirements to all of these national legislations and you know language access laws and what have you in all of these different countries? Absolutely, but I mean there would be a yeah. massive opportunity to have a consolidated back end and kind of a consolidated linguistic. Uh, um, kind of pool of you Manage. know qualified resources, mm -hmm. etc. So, just putting it out there. Get in touch if you want to have some strategy <laughs> advice. <laughs> just kidding. Uh, cool. All right. So that was it for today's news roundup, and we'll head over to talk to Andrew Bread and Kemp. See All you in right. a bit. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome back to Slater Pot episode 100. Very special guest today for this uh, century episode. Joining us today is Andrew Braden, come CEO of the NGO Clear Tech and chair of Clear Global, a uh, parent company, of course. Hi, Andrew. Hi there. Hi, everyone. Hi, Andrew. Welcome. <laughs> nice to meet you. So, Andrew, usually I ask people where this podcast finds them. In your case, I know because you're joining us, I guess, from the place near Zurich where actually I grew up in. Yes, that your true? school, your former school is a short walk up the hill uh, from there you here. Go. So, um, yeah. Familiar, uh, familiar Small shores world. there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, hey, Andrew, so uh, we, we met a couple of times, of course, in, in person actually since the pandemic. But uh, last time, uh, you know, you also presented at our Amsterdam conference uh, and you had, a, you had a great story to tell there around language data, etc. cetera. Uh, you have a very long background in the uh, language technology space. So before we go into Clear Global and you know how uh, what what the mission is there, why don't you tell us a bit more about your uh, professional background and the kind of your journey in in, in the space? Uh, yeah, happy. I, I happy to. I think uh, first thing I would say is I'm really uh, although I've spent the last uh, 25 years or so doing language technology, I'm really a language person. I my first degree was in languages. Um, uh, then in translation and then in linguistics. And I only late on got into uh, the language technology and AI, particularly natural language processing. So I, and I, the reason I mentioned that is that I really do come from the angle of why this stuff is useful and what it's all about, rather than mm -hmm. being a technologist looking to, you know, be having a screwdriver and looking for screws everywhere or hammers and nails, whatever the, the analogy is. So I come at it from, a desire to communicate and a desire and a, a passion about um, about uh, you know crossing language barriers and how we can communicate more effectively. Technology is just a fascinating way, another piece of the puzzle as to how to do that well. So my background is really uh, I I um, ended up having uh, studied lots of things, ended up doing a PhD in natural language processing, then uh, moved to to Germany in in the 90s, uh, the late 90s, um, to work at the German Research Center for AI. 
I then led a couple of projects there. I ran the transfer center. Um, and out of that came a, 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 a spin-off that we ran uh, um, uh, for in Berlin for, for 20 years or so. Um, alongside that, I started working with Translators Without Borders, as was um, I was a founding board member of the US entity. Uh, Laurie Thick founded a, a French entity. And then as we expanded, we, we uh, founded a US entity. Um, and, um, and then I took over as chair when Laurie stepped down, um, became uh, more and more involved in that. As I stepped away from my company, uh, at the end of 2019, I suddenly got very involved with, uh, with with TWB. We made a transition to Clear Global, and we'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, and uh, I've since sort of stepped in to join to really help to drive the technology piece of the puzzle that we're now doing at Clear Global. Um, and uh, uh, very exciting uh, times indeed. So it's a, it's a good place to be. And before we jump into sort of clear tech, clear global, um, I think, you know, many of our listeners will be familiar or very familiar uh, with Translators Without Borders. Um, I mean, you were there for more than a decade. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the kind of pre-clear global era um, and some of the key milestones and challenges along the way with TWB? So, um, yeah, I think there's probably been three phases to it. Uh, to the history of TWB and now in Clear Global, the the first phase was very much a. Um, it, the, so the whole thing started when Laurie Thick uh, asked some of her translators if they would volunteer their time to work with humanitarian organisations in the Paris area. So it became very much if you would work for free, could you eat, could we do translations for these for these local NGOs? As it grew, it grew into a large community of volunteers who were offering their time, spare time, largely as translators uh, between jobs or, or, or you know, evenings and weekends to, 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 to help with this, these, these, this content that needed to, be, needed to be translated. But it was very much a volunteer effort. And as it grew, it became harder and harder for us to meet the needs of our partners, big UN agencies, um, huge international organizations who were trying often to respond in crisis situations where they needed guaranteed turnaround times and uh, really well run projects and so there was a bit of a there was a need to put a, a layer in between that of 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 professional project management and and technical resources etc all of the things you know if you if you've worked in an LSP or or similar you'll know that these things uh, it becomes more complicated than just a translator translating stuff and so there's all those layers as it scales mm. that we had to put on top of that so we started there was a shift from pure volunteer to um, to hiring a professional staff and hiring project managers who could help to marshal the resources and work with the community to meet the needs of our of our um, of our major partners we work with all the big UN agencies all the big international NGOs as well as increasingly local organizations worldwide so that was one big shift that we made and moved into phase two which is where we were still largely translating but it was uh, translating as a as a as a much more professional organization um, and um, and then came that I think it didn't come all of a sudden it came gradually over time that we evolved into adding way more things to our um, to our portfolio of services we were offering companies um, uh, our organizations that partners organizations that we were working with so um, language services really meant more than just translation. It meant software localization, but it also meant um, advising them on communication strategies. It meant designing posters and, and um, um, doing radio broadcasts and a whole range, you know, subtitling, a whole range of other activities that, w that went beyond, um, beyond classic translation localization. And... Mm -hmm technology came into the mix so we were being asked uh, to you know could we pro provide machine translation for some of these language pairs that no one else was doing for low for low resource languages could we provide voice technology speech recognition i'll talk more about that in a second but the whole technology thing started and at the same time people were asking us so we're going into cote d'ivoire which languages do we need and suddenly we needed to research we needed to have a research uh, um, profile where we could find out 
how can we quickly discover what the language need is? How do we reach people if we want to communicate to people in languages they'll understand? So out of that came a, a need for research, a need for technology and the traditional sort of language services piece that became also often very embedded in programs. So we had offices in countries where we were providing language services as well as this global remote community um, that was working. So it became a bigger thing out of that, way more than translators. Um, and uh, the translation remains a huge part of what we do, but we were growing out inside of it. And that was the need for sort of the, the idea, behind, the drive behind needing to, to give space for those other pieces to grow. Um, and I think, so that's the first part, the name change. The second part of the name change is really about the without borders piece. The without borders mm -hmm. concept is very, it's a very, uh, it, it captures the idea very well if you're flying doctors from Europe uh, or, or, or the global north into Africa for some crisis or the Philippines for a hurricane or a typhoon or whatever. But our, our um, whole approach is deeply local first, right? It's really about understanding the local needs and having local people, helping local people meet those local needs. So it's not about us coming in and saving the people in, in these places who don't know how to help themselves. They do. All we're doing is, is enabling some of that or helping some of that or, or bringing together conversations, making them happen. So the without borders thing felt a bit, un was a bit uncomfortable to us in the sense it doesn't capture our approach and our, our, the, our ethos, which is very much local first. So that was kind of what was behind the desire to shift away from that slowly. Translators Without Borders remains the name for our community, which is really a, a global, a huge global community which works across borders and they are largely translators. So we felt that that was a good name for for, for that community, but the other pieces um, now have a larger mission and a and, and room to grow into it. Got it. So you had this ev evolution uh, right. and then kind of launched into that brand expansion also. Um, <coughs> can you um, give us a sense of the, I mean, the size and the breadth of the organization? I mean, what you've already described is vast. Um, but I mean, in terms of the number of offices, volunteers, the mission, etc. So we were um, sure we were we were um, we were ready for COVID before it hit. So we've been a, a virtual organization since since the beginning. Uh, we have no big uh, brick and mortar office anywhere. Um, but we have um, we, we've now we've grown the community uh, or the community has grown. I'd like to say we can take all the credit. But in fact, it's largely, you know, um, I think the, the, the community has grown itself. People have have um, have been flocking to us to volunteer their time and effort, which is hugely appreciated. We've grown the community, I think, from when um, uh, from when I took over as chair, I think we were about 3000 people when when we hired Amy, our our um, our executive director um and uh she and the team have grown the the uh have grown it now to over 80,000 people um uh and um they are in 148 149 countries something like that we have hundreds of language pairs uh over 200 languages covered um and um it it's really a uh, it's it's become a huge global thing that we are now starting to 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 uh, to really get our uh, yeah get our, get get our heads around what we can how we can work together with this with this community. I think up until now it's been largely a resource that that has has offered their time for language services, but um, there are many other things we'd like the community to be doing too. So how big is kind of the admin uh, group of of the the organization, and maybe can you just speak a little bit about financing and funding, and where you kind of been mo most successful? So um, we have a we have a, a a team of people who manage um, who who manage the community. That, I wouldn't say manage the community; they're sort of uh, nurturing the community and working with the community. It's a very collaborative sort of effort, um, and um, Largely, the funding for our work comes from two or three different sources. So the first hand, the, the first um, major part of it is partnerships we have with the with the big international organizations. So with the big UN agencies, we have uh, global partnership agreements where we we um, uh, annual agreements where we we uh, 
we uh, we agree to offer them language services of various kinds. Um, we also have uh, similar agreements with big international NGOs and and and, and the like. Um, so you know, save the children and uh, 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 all those kinds of organisations. So that that's all happen. That that's a sort of partnership model, really, for language services. Very similar to a sort of client vendor situation with uh, with a, with an LSP. Um, although, of course, uh, you know, we are we're, we're negotiating sort of the unlike an LSP, we're very focused on the mission part of this so we don't do we don't do their press releases we don't do their websites we don't do any fundraising mm. activity for them we working on the content that they need the information that they need that helps drive the mission so it's really operational content mission oriented content designed to reach people who aren't normally getting access to information so translation for us has to be for a reason if you just want to translate your website into from english into french we're not going to provide those services for you. We can get, there's plenty of commercial vendors that will do that. That's not our mission. We're focused on delivering that content where we can, where we can provide um, a, a humanitarian development uh, aspect to that, where it's not currently being done because it's not commercially viable. So we have, all, we have those, kinds of, those kinds of packages. The second kind of work we do is largely program, project funded, program funded, where uh, big international donors, institutional donors, big governments, uh, the government agencies that fund international development or crisis response, um, they provide funding for us in many contexts to support large scale crisis response. So in Northeast Nigeria, for example, um, in, uh, in DRC around the Ebola uh, um, uh, crisis in Bangladesh for the um, around the Rohingya uh, uh, situation, many of those kinds of situations, there will be a huge international response and we will be there to support that response with their, with their communication needs, translation, localization, other, and other communication needs around that. So the programs will be funded, will be funded as kind of a shared service across, the, uh, uh, across those responses. And then when you think about the, the group, um, the clear group, you've got a couple of different sort of things going on there. You've got clear tech, clear insights. Um, maybe walk us through how how you collaborate across some across the, the organization. And if you're thinking specifically about one of like a recent project or something, can you give us an example of how how some of the, the organization work together across those groups? So yeah, I can I, I can give you an idea of how how it should work in practice, in, in, in theory. Yeah. It never quite works like this. But the broad idea is that um, we're, a, we're an evidence-based organization. So we don't want to do anything unless we understand why we're doing it. Uh, what, is, there a, is there a genuine justification for doing it? And are we doing the right things to have the most impact? So our mission is to give people access to information and have their voices heard. So it's about these two-way conversations that we're trying to set up. So first thing is we need to do some research to understand what languages are spoken, what channels are available, you know, uh, what's the digital access, what, do people have access digitally to information or is everything on radio or how do they get access to information? What are the levels of literacy? Um, and and what are the uh, how do we reach the most marginalized people who get left behind in many of these other programs? So the first thing is to understand what we're doing. Often people come and say, we want a chatbot. And we'll go, well, really? Do, are you sure you want a chatbot? What's your, mm -hmm. why, you know, and they want the new shiny toy, but there's no data to suggest that that will actually reach more people or have more impact. So we, we want to do the research to understand, uh, are we going to have impact by doing this thing? And that will be often be a collaborative thing um, uh, where we, and that would give us confidence that what we're going to do is the is the right way of reaching of reaching these people and engaging them in these conversations. First thing. Second thing is to design a program which might include a technology piece, but it might not. Right. The, the best way to reach people might be to make some posters and print them out and stick them on the wall. Right. It's unlikely that that simple approach would work. Typically, you want to have multiple channels and. Where we do do technology, it's usually folded into other ways of other community engagement or accountability. Accountability is about asking people, giving people access, uh, letting them t letting them tell you when what what they're thinking and how they're how they're um, uh, how they're they're engaging with the the work that you're doing. Uh, community engagement is really about getting them on board. So both of those things 
multiple strategies are usually needed. So you want to have multiple channels, but you need to know what they are. So the research will tell us what they are, and then we'll design those in a in a combined package um, that would then uh, that would then um, be the right way to the most effective way to reach people. And then we have we have the program work that needs to happen, and that will normally be a collaboration. Most of our most of our projects involve partnerships where we work with big international organizations or preferably also local organizations that understand the context really well and can you know understand how how all the the the, the bits and pieces need to work so the the strategy is kind of research so we know what we're doing uh, design programs which will often be supported by technology which gives you that extra scale and that extra reach and then uh, partnerships with whoever we 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 need to work with in order to, to get stuff done on the ground because as i said we're largely a virtual organization we do have staff and in countries uh, but but typically most of our work or a big part of our work is provided uh, provided remotely so they're the sort of key three bits to it and underlying that of course is also the community that who supports all of these activities as we, as we go along you mentioned a couple of countries before and projects like where where's the current focus and like how do you pick those projects do you pick them do they pick you do you have like a list of 100 things that you could work on and then you could prioritize or so we've been we've uh, we've recently added a few areas. So tr traditionally, uh, focus our focus has been in South Asia, especially Bangladesh and Sub-Saharan Africa. But over the last year or so, um, we've been running projects in South and Central America. In uh, now recently started a project in India. We've done projects remotely in over eighty countries. As in, we have we have worked together with partners who are doing work in those countries where we've supported their work. So our reach is. Is in has been into over eighty countries. We have offices, real brick and mortar offices, um, in in three countries, um, but we have reached into in, into many many more. And I would say um, Central America, um, especially South America, also. But Central America is is going to continue to is going to continue to grow. We're doing a lot of stuff around the Venezuela uh, a refugee migrant uh, situation. Um, uh, South Asia is a is is a is a huge area. So many different aspects of of, of our work are, are, um, are we're getting engaged in there, and and Sub-Saharan Africa is is um, is a yeah we're we're expanding in those in 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 there as well. Um, Kenya, uh, Nigeria, DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, but now. Uh, yeah, working in Uganda and Rwanda and other other countries as well. So it's it's a it's an expanding an expanding situation. Just starting a project um, for Amharic, for example, um, which will involve not people in Ethiopia, but will involve us working with uh, with with Ethiopian staff. Um, you you, uh, you mentioned Venezuela. So when I think Venezuela, I think Venezuelans crossing the border into Colombia. But that's Spanish. Spanish. Where's the language component? Right. Well, I mean, the, the, don't want to the, put you on the spot. <laughs> there are so there are regional languages. Uh, there are there are non-Spanish speakers. But you're right. It's not Spanish. Is not a is not a um, obviously then it's not a translation problem that we're facing. But it is an access to information problem. So um, that's one aspect to it. Is that first of all, what we've done is opened up a new channel of communication through a through conversational AI, through a chatbot that we made available in uh, in Peru, um, Ecuador, and, um, and, and Mexico. Um, but an important aspect of that is, and, and it's really about providing people access to information through a new channel. So it's not, it's not translating anything. The information is all there, but it's not been, this channel is making it accessible to more people. That's the first thing. The second thing is, is the streams of, inform the streams of people who are flowing um, f from from the south towards the U the, the the US? Um, they're not just Venezuelan uh, migrants or refugees. It turns out that there are there are, suddenly we we were discovering because we were listening as well as as well as speaking. It was a two way conversation. We were able to discover that there were lots of French speakers in in this flow flow of humanity. Um, turns out that uh, there is a a, an established flow of people from West Africa who are going through this and joining these uh, these um, uh, 
uh, uh, these these channels and 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 trying to get to trying to get to to the U.S. So um, there was a lot of questions coming in in French uh, for uh, around information that they were trying to get hold of. On top of that came Haitian Creole uh, because of the continued crisis in in that country has led uh, has led that that those people to be joining that as well. So it's not as simple. Um, it's they, these things are never as simple as they as they look at, at first. Um, yeah. You mentioned uh, chat chatbots there. Um, so, um, can you tell us how that works exactly? Like, how do chatbots enter the picture, and and when? Because you said it's not always appropriate, but how and where do you use them? Yeah. So, um, chatbots starting. I mean, chatbots have become a thing. They were a huge hype, uh, uh, and 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 rightly because I think they're a fascinating new area of of new channel for communication with people, but they have suffered from every other techno the, the fate of every other technology, which means massively overhyped. And then people get disappointed with them because they, 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 they make assumptions about them, which aren't, which aren't, uh, which the technology can't live up to. So a few things, I think, um, chatbots are huge. It's not, not a very well-defined thing, right? It could be a chatbots can be incredibly dumb. They can be very transaction oriented, like they can just say, I, you know, I can help you um, open a bank account or move some money from one account to another or whatever in banking. Um, they can help you, you know, answer your support question if you go onto their website, whatever. They can be incredibly dumb things. But if they're used properly, then they can be really used for two way interaction, for conversation. So conversation is a big word but what we mean by that is that we listen as well as speaking so we're actually taking the effort to elicit information and 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 um hear from what the person has to say as well as just saying we're going to tell you some stuff now obviously you can then think compared to a poster um uh this is a two-way conversation right automatically and that's a really interesting yeah. area is that we can we can build uh we can build really interesting experiences like that second thing is they can be multilingual so everyone in sub-Saharan Africa is multilingual, right? So, they, so the question is, you can't just put something out in one language and, and expect it to work for everybody. And so um, what, the, what the tech community has just discovered is this thing called code switching, which has been around forever, but it's this idea of people switching languages as they speak. And mm. this is really hard for traditional tech to get to, get it, to, get, uh, to work with. And so we've, what we've been working on is building multilingual multilingual chatbots that can exist in that kind of environment can be two way mm. can be um and can be comfortable with switching languages in the middle of a conversation etc and the last part of them that i think is key in our approach has been that we really take the listening piece seriously so we look at the conversations we work out what the conversations are about we were able to discover for example in our first chatbot which went out in the in the early days of covid in in sub-saharan africa in drc um we took the WHO's information and put it into a chatbot, basically, as an FAQ. So you could ask it things about what the WHO was saying about COVID. Now, what, what turned out was that young mothers, especially, were really interested in, can I pass it to my child? Or if I'm pregnant, will the child get it? Or what's the risk to my baby? WHO had said nothing about that yet, but we were able to give them feedback that this is a huge content gap that you have because we were listening to what the conversations were about. And then we were able to plug that content gap and, and, and move on. So that listening piece is not just a, it's not just a slogan. It's actually something that makes us better in the way we, um, uh, the way we engage with people. And, those, and so indeed. we're learning. Uh, sorry, just one last thing. I think we're learning how this works. We've done, you know, we've done now a series of chatbot programs in in, in uh, uh, South Central America, in India. We're doing one in Kenya and Nigeria and whatever. It, everyone's been different right now, so we're we're still learning as to how what the different ways of using this this tool are, depending on the context. Mm. And, and what's the interface there? I mean, is it a, a smartphone? And if it's a smartphone or like a semi-smartphone? And if it's a smartphone, does it have to be connected to the internet? Or can it kind of, you know, from time so to time two, be connected? Yeah, there are a couple of different ways. I mean, I think that what we've done so far largely has been um, smartphones, has been with um, uh, text messaging on, on, on Facebook or WhatsApp Messenger or um, so Facebook Messenger or WhatsApp or, or, or Telegram, whatever. 
Um, we can also do it via, S, uh, via SMS gateways. And, and, and so going into uh, lower level connectivity, people have that. Um, we also have a thing, um, I know this won't go out on phone, but we have a, a, um, uh, a hardware solution, um, which, um, uh, which we call Tiles, which is a, a Raspberry Pi with a little screen on it. And you can put, you can put conversational AI onto a Raspberry Pi, which is a little credit, credit card size computer. Yeah. And then you can put that out in health centers or hardware stores or um, you know, places of worship or wherever people gather who have no connectivity and perhaps no literacy uh, or low levels of literacy and give them the opportunity to talk to the, li literally to talk to them and, and, and have a conversation. So the conversational AI as an engine can be used in lots of different, in lots of different modes. What do you see as coming next? I mean, where are you sort of spending time and money on R and D um, when it comes to sort of AI and machine learning based language technology? So, um, we work uh, we, we work with existing technology wherever we can. So, language tech mm. if language technology exists, we're not going to build it again. But in many cases, especially for the most uh, uh, for for the most marginalised people. They speak languages that aren't well supported by uh, by by commercial software, and so we spend time uh, understanding how we can quickly build language technology for those languages. Often with very little data available, so often we have to create the data, which is a, a, another another context where we want to uh, mobilize our community to help us create data more quickly for for these languages. So we build core technology for voice recognition, for the, the stuff, the, under, the underlying machinery for chatbots, as well as machine translation, which we continue to work on. Um, but at the same time, we're also looking at deploying the, you know, not just building the engines, but actually building applications. So opening up mm. channels of communication in those languages. And um, so it's a, a multi-layer thing. We collaborate with, um, there are amazing networks now of, of, of um, local so much expertise especially in sub-saharan africa uh the networks there's a network called masakane which develops natural language processing yeah, technology we we're collaborating with them on on using you know developing expertise working with local experts and um uh, often researchers or, or or young students who are doing their masters or their phds in in these areas uh, and helping um helping them also understand where their technology can be used to, to, to have social impact. So it's a very collaborative uh, uh, environment and the research is really around, around those key three areas in, in low resource languages. We also work with, um, with, with uh, big tech, uh, with Google and Microsoft and others, uh, Amazon and, and, and Facebook and others on on collaborative efforts, open source collaborative efforts to drive more um, more availability of, of of technology for low resource languages. Um, so um, yeah, there there are there are many players in this. Can, can you tell us a bit more about Africans uh, specifically? And I think you you traveled there, you know, pre COVID. I'm not sure since then, but like, what, what's kind of the language technology environment there? Also from a talent perspective, is it hard to find these people or convince them to help you work for you are you competing with big tech like how does that work yeah i i would never say they work for us they 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 hopefully work with us um that is it which is a, a, a maybe a pedantic distinction but an important one yeah. the um there is a, there are huge networks so you know when we started the whole technology piece we were the only people doing this seriously uh nobody nobody else we helped google build uh, google and microsoft build their their first uh, uh, Swahili machine translation capabilities uh, back in the day. Um, but um, now uh, we are a tiny part of a much, much larger network of experts. Um, some experts as well as a lot of people who are getting into this. So anybody who, any, any young student who gets into machine learning and AI wants to do either natural language processing or vision. They're the two things that you do. So there is a, there's been an explosion of expertise and, and, and talent. And, and so it's become less, we need to do this our, on our own and more, we need to work out how to work with this expertise to help, um, to help it have social impact, as I say, and not all, um, and not all just remain as research papers. So, so, I mean, I was really interested in what you said there with kind of collaborating a little bit with big tech. 
Um, I mean, can you tell us a little bit more about how, how that might work in practice? Is it, is it sort of they're feeding information or data into you? Do you channel anything back once a project is closed? I mean, where, where's the benefit um, for, clearly, for both parties? Yeah, I mean, clearly the, it, has to be a, it has to be a win-win. We, we only work with them on projects which are aligned with our mission and where we're, where we're seeing impact for, for us. Um, mm -hmm. One major initiative that we did um, has been uh, uh, we ran a project together with the, those those big organizations I just mentioned uh, around COVID information. Um, most of the existing machine translation engines didn't work very well with COVID information. They didn't know what social distancing was or all of the other terminology and jargon that we suddenly invented in, 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 when confronted with COVID. And so we worked in a collaborative effort with all of those organizations in, in a thing called Tico 19, where we built uh, language data to train all of their engines on, um, uh, or to, you know, to improve all of their engines with respect to uh, COVID information, so that, that so that all of their engines were getting better. All of the content was um, uh, was open source, released under 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 Creative Commons, and is widely available. So it wasn't just us working for someone and giving them content that belonged to them mm -hmm. and was locked away. So it was a it was an effort that was for the uh, for the common good um, and uh, helped drive drive things forward. Of course, lots of people still use Google Translate and and and, and Microsoft Translation software capability in order to get information. So, um, you know, it, it's uh, it, it's not something we want to ignore just because, um, you know, because they're a commercial company uh, that, that makes lots of profit. You know, that's that's something that that's not interesting to us. What's interesting is do we um, do we are we uh, are we achieving our mission? Over the past two to three years, have you noticed like an improvement in all those low resource language, empty engine slash applications? Because, I mean, we've we've noticed that like there's been a huge interest, especially also from big tech around low resource. And then you have these massive multilingual models, which are supposedly kind of translating anything to anything. And like, are you, is this PR, is it research PR, or do you feel there's an actual breakthrough happening here? Uh, great question. Great question. Um, I, I think it's overhyped. I think the, I, I think the, the, I mean, these are these are serious these are serious research efforts, and the results are really impressive. And they are serious research efforts, directionally really really interesting. Um, what it what it doesn't mean is that you know we have uh, we we have now for a hundred languages ma machine translation capability like we have for English, French, Spanish, uh, uh, and the like. Um, you know, which are now at sort of uh, almost at human at human levels. Um, the, the the translation soft the the, the translation um, uh, quality deteriorates quite quickly once you get past mm. that 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 first front languages and so um, yeah I d you know that often people will think that there is there is machine translation capability in all of these languages it's not usable in the way that that it, in the way that um, that it is for the big languages but. Uh, you know, I'm old enough to 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 remember what machine translation was like for French, uh, English French, 20 years ago. So it's a journey, right? It's not a binary. Suddenly it works or it doesn't work. It's a it's a journey that we're on. And these things live by data. They live by getting used and getting and and and, and people engaging with them. And and so it's a huge milestone to say at least we have capability in those languages and it will start to get used. The key thing is to make sure it gets used and doesn't stay in the, you know, in, in the research community, because that way it will grow, it will get better, and, and, and ultimately it will get there. It will get to the place where where English, French, Spanish uh, is now. And um, but it's um, it's not happening quite as fast as some people would 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 like you to believe. How can our listeners get involved with your efforts? Um, how can they support? What what should they do? Yeah, how can they be of use? Um, so, uh, your donations are always very welcome. We like, uh, obviously we need money to, to, to run the operation as, as, as Florian said. And so, um, donations are always very welcome, but I think from anyone with, uh, with an expertise or a talent in, 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 in language, um, we have a huge range of things, uh, that, that, that we're engaged in, uh, and we would, uh, 
uh, you can sign up as a volunteer on on our website um, and uh, join join the community and um, and we'll be in touch with uh, you know to discuss how we uh, uh, how we can engage with things. I mean, there's a there's a say there's there's a lot for us to do. Um, we have uh, um, uh, grown incredibly fast over the years, mainly because there is an almost unlimited demand for what we do. This 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 idea of um, uh, giving people access to information in in and. In, in, reaching the most marginalized people um, has uh, has enormous resonance from anyone with a background in language who understands how much of a barrier it can be to be stuck in a situation where, uh, where, where you don't understand what's going on around you. And imagine that multiplied by a thousand and imagine the world going on, the internet happening, and you're not able to be part of it. And that's really, you know, that's really a, a, a huge motivation for people to get involved. And the way in which they get involved will change over time. But join our community and 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 become part of it. I would, I would strongly recommend it. So with so much going on, what are the top two or three exciting initiatives for you in twenty twenty two? For clear so, tech, let's say let's limit it to clear tech. Okay. <laughs> so we have, um, you know, we have some new channels. This 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 tiles device, which is for the first time, literally last year, for the first time, we were able to get conversational AI voice recognition and conversational AI on a on a Raspberry Pi. This is a new development that is happening, and we don't know where that will go. That's now getting down to the size where, for fifteen dollars, you can buy a little computer on a half size credit card size chip and put tech on it. So that wow. we're inter really interested on where that's going. Um, you know, where can we put these devices? What kind of reach can we have with that, with those kinds of technologies? Um, and uh, chatbots have only just started. We've scratched the surface on that. So those kind of interactions would are, are really interesting. A big area for us is really how do we mobilize our community for some of these efforts as well? How can we mobilize them to help create language technology for their own languages? So our uh, our community of of um, of Hausa speakers in the north of Nigeria. How can we work with them to help build more Hausa technology um, and validate the data that we uh, that, that we're seeing and and label it and help us build better better language tech. So uh, that's one aspect to it. And I think on the on the research side as well. How can we how can we gain more insights from our community that will help us do the do the right kinds of things. So I think engaging the community and Really bringing the technology, we used to have this team called Special Projects who were working on little tech things to try out, proof of concept type thing. And I think last year and now really this year is going to be the year where that moves into uh, mainstream. And that's going, to be, that's going to be a lot of fun. Exciting. Well, thanks to uh, a big thanks to you and to to the whole team for the really valuable work you do. Really appreciate it, and uh, hopefully that uh, you know we can help a bit spreading the word again and uh, helping with the positioning of Clear Global now uh, heading into 2022. So, Andrew, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for your time. I really appreciate it. Thanks for for giving me the the opportunity to to, to talk to your audience. Absolutely, super interesting. Thanks. Mm -hmm.